Hi, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about Chapter 11, Part 1, where we will be discovering all the elements of finishes for walls and floors. So let's get started, shall we, on these finishes. Right now, we're going to dive into walls, okay? <laughs> now, there are two types of walls that interior designers deal with, load-bearing walls and non-load-bearing walls. Now, load-bearing walls, they support the roof system, and they are very um, structurally sound. And usually, as designers, I don't touch those unless I consult a structural engineer and an architect. Now, non-load-bearing walls, they're all the partitions in between. They're the walls that separate bedrooms and various other rooms in the home or commercial space. And as a designer, I am able to you know, work with those, add them, demo them. However, remember, each wall is not what it seems. They house copious amounts of things that you don't see, such as electrical, plumbing, um, in insulation. So there's things in those walls, such as this one here, that we don't see. So we have to be careful not to just be knocking down walls recklessly. We should always check the architecturals, check with the contractor, and make sure it's feasible. Now, um, basically, most interior um, partitions like this are covered with what's called jipboard or drywall. And pretty simple. So they're stud construction, either um, steel or wood. Um, they have those layers of jipboard. Inside they house plumbing. They may house electrical. They may house um, insulation. So it's important to actually understand the kind of structure of what you're dealing with, with the standard um, building of a wall. And let's face it, you know, these visual walls, they add aesthetic um, opportunities for us to apply something to. They add acoustical and visual security and privacy. So walls can either be, you know, they are functional and sometimes we want to add them and sometimes we want to take them away to open up a space. So let's dive in now that we know that the walls we're dealing with, the um, load-bearing walls or structural and the non-load-bearing walls or the partitions, the interior partitions. So there are so many phenomenal wall treatments that we can use as an interior designer. And every year we get more and more innovative options. And of course, there's trends. Remember shiplap? I mean, that's what, you know, Chip and Joe and Gaines love. Just, that's just one example of a finish. So let's dive into all of our options. And like I said, there are many more, but it'd take all day to go through them. So we're looking at walls. These are issues that you want to address before you start going and specifying materials. Besides the health and safety of the product itself, you want to think about the maintenance. Is it going to be hard to clean? Is it, you know, you want to think about the texture of the wall. If it's highly textured, um, will it receive wall covering? The location of it as well. You also want to always consider the budget, right? Um, look at the style, the color, the pattern preference. Um, you want to make sure, does the room have a lot of humidity? Is it exposed to a lot of heat or extreme temperatures? That will affect the type of material you put on your wall. Now, also too, even the room size, any areas in the room or on a wall you maybe want to emphasize or minimize because it's awkward. And the length of time people spend in that room. That may not make sense, but actually if someone's spending a lot long time in a room, then you may use colors or choices that promote that. If they're quick in and out, Maybe the room can be a little more um, exciting and promote a lot of energy, but that might not be good and cause fatigue if you were in there for a long amount of time. And also the objects you need to hang. So if you're going to uh, hang an amazing art gallery wall, you probably want would not want to put it on a very textured uh, relief sculptural type of material. So you have to know, well, what am I going to put on this wall that's applied on top of the finish? That matters as well. So let's just go to our number one go-to and the number one thing that you can do to change an interior right away. 
and that would be paint. And let me tell you, paint has been around for a very a long time. Um, way back in the caveman days, right? Even we had uh, fresco walls that were painted with wet plaster in the Greek and Roman times. So painting has been an expression on um, wall treatments for centuries and centuries. So this is probably the most inexpensive way and easiest way to change your interior like that, right? Just paint the wall. Paint offers protection of the surface. It comes in so many colors. And you can even imitate other types of materials by faux, faux painting. So when you think of paint, it is just a nonstop rainbow sh shop. I mean, you want to change the look of a paint in, in a room, it goes from white to red. Boy, that's going to be a game changer, right? So paint is extremely important. And we need to understand a little bit about how to specify this and what type of finish, because that's what is always the big question mark. Now, paint um, reflectance of the wall varies. So we have different paint finishes. And it's interesting because most people think that flat paint is the way to go. But I'll talk to you about what's most appropriate for each one of these finishes. Flat paint, eggshell or satin, semi-gloss, high gloss, and suede finish. So these are little tips for specifying the paint because that is actually your job. So when I do my paint specifications on each paint, I have to specify the finish. If I'm specifying a blue paint three different times, times or types of finish, I have to specify it three times. I have to specify it in the three finishes that I am going to utilize it. So because the painter has to buy that blue, three times and three different finishes. So it's really important you understand what finish should go on what. Now, you want to choose the best quality of paint and a really reputable brand. I use, for instance, a lot of Sherman Williams or Dunn Edwards or Vista Paints. These brands are um, true and tried. They're also national. So if I am specifying a project that is in Missouri, I know that they can get Sherman William Paints or a, a well brand name. Um, if it's you know an off brand or a very um, inexpensive uh, one off, then it's very difficult to specify it on a national level. And the manufacturer will really stand by those paints. So you want really great quality, and you want it to have low VOCs. I keep saying that word. <laughs> that is that. Low VOCs, volcan vo volcanic organic compound, these are off gases, and that's what causes that sick building syndrome. So you want to make sure they're very low. The good news is Sherman Williams and all of these major paint companies have paints that literally have zero VOCs. So they have come so far, and it's really a delight. There are some brands that I don't use because the off gases are just too much. The fumes are just um, unbearable. So we want to be careful. Um, you want to make sure that the contractor prepares the surface correctly. Are they putting the right primer? Are they patching and so forth? And always keep a little jar. I use um, just the, my little, my little uh, mason jars filled with touch-up paint. This wall that's red that you're seeing, one little ding, and all of a sudden you're seeing that white drywall, and that's a little pain. So at, always having a little jar of touch-up paint is key. Even with your clients, I always make sure that the painter creates a little um, sample set of all of the paints for them. And then always discard. When you're discarding the paint that you don't use, it needs to be done correctly. We're trying to save the environment here, and it's illegal just to dump paint down the sink or in a drain and put it in the trash. You need to actually take the lid off, let it be exposed for several days, and allow the paint to completely dry up, and then take that paint and those toxins to an actual paint store or places like Lowe's or Home Depot. They will discard it for you. I don't want anyone to get a fine for discarding um, toxic materials. <laughs> Okay, so what finish goes where? Well, this is probably a great rule of thumb. When you're using flat paint or no shine, please just use it 
in places like the garage or the ceiling. Any area that you even want to remotely try to cl clean, you don't want to use flat paint. It does not clean. The moment you start wiping it off, you will find that you're going to end up seeing the drywall. And that is no fun. And it just shows dirt because it just won't wipe off. So flat paint only goes on ceilings, garages. Now, eggshell and satin, they're basically synonymous. They're kind of the same. And it's just a really light sheen. And it's perfect for interior walls that don't require a lot of um, cleaning or are wet and um, have any moisture. So I love this um, particular finish. In fact, probably 90% of all my paint is in one of these finishes. So your living room and uh, dining room and places like that would use uh, your living quarters, family room would use the eggshell, satin, and your bedrooms. So that's just the rule of thumb. And trust me, they have very little sheen. You almost can't tell the difference, but you can clean some smudge off of the walls if you need. Now, semi-gloss, they're a little higher sheen and they are needed for places that have wet areas, such as bathrooms, and kitchens. So it's actually code that you'll do that. In fact, if you go into my kitchen, it actually flows into the dining area and you see a line where one is more, sh more shiny and the other is flatter. So you want to make sure that any area that's wet, um, that ha has moisture, you're going to put the higher sheen, what's this called, semi bus. And that makes it super easy to clean. And trust me, you're very thankful when that spaghetti sauce gets on that back wall and you can wipe it down. Now, high gloss is super shiny. And the problem with high gloss is it shows all imperfections. So I don't recommend it on a wall unless that wall is pretty perfect. But we do use it for all of our trims, our doors, um, any uh, crown molding. So that shiny reflection makes it super easy to clean and gives a nice contrast to the flatter wall. So you'll find that there. So in these trims and so forth. So flat paint on the ceiling, um, the more of the gloss or semi-gloss, on the trims, you have more of a satin on your walls, and then the trims go gloss here. So here we have all the different types of, of paint finish. Now we're going to dive into uh, one of the oldest uh, finishes uh, for walls because it really brings the exterior into the into the uh, interior space. So brick. Brick's been around forever. It's very strong and durable. It's made of clay and water and sail. So it's 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 historical, you know, we've had it for hundreds of years. It requires very little maintenance and it comes in a variety of earthy type tones. And um, manufactured usually um, in the area where it's located. So you'll find different tones in different um, areas. So in um, New Mexico, you might find that the clay is more orange, where perhaps in Sonoma or Arizona, the clay might be more red. So sometimes it's a regional thing, but there's various amounts of colors. Now, if um, you can't afford brick, and I love brick, I have been known to use brick paneling. So this is my cheat. In fact, this is in my upstairs uh, jazz room, we call that, where we have our music room. This is just a sheet, but it sure looks like brick. So there are ways that if your budget doesn't lend it. Now, brick is really um, popular right now, giving that warmth, that kind of industrial vibe. So we're utilizing it more and more and really taking the outside and bringing it in. Sometimes we're even tearing down that drywall and seeing that lovely brick and we want to expose it. So, um, and it's used often in, you know, fireplaces, coarse flooring, but walls and seeing it more and more on interior walls, little taverns. As I do um, more and more restaurants, we utilize that for that industrial cool like vibe. And it gives it kind of a loft, um, a loft element. So this brick in this interior really adds warmth to the space. Now, you'll find that if you're adding brick and it's not coming from the exterior, a lot of times you use what's called brick veneer and it's very thin and you put it up just like tile and that is the way to go and it isn't as heavy as a full brick. Or you can just use my paneling too. 
Next, we're going to go to concrete. Now, concrete has been, made a big comeback. Um, mixture of cement and adjectives, uh, um, adjectives, <laughs> and it's a uh, with water, and it's very strong, and it really gains strength over time. It's affordable. It's malleable. Uh, it resists moisture, mold, and, and pest. So this is why we use it outdoors and in construction. Your very foundation is built on brick or on concrete. Excuse me. Um, very little maintenance. It doesn't need to be sealed if it's on the floor, but on walls, not so much. And a benefit, it's highly fire resistant. It's just kind of intrinsically like that. So it doesn't promote flame spread. And that's a good thing. Um, so cement, you know, we've used to seen a lot of that. Exposed cement walls are used a lot in that industrial or commercial vibe. You'll even see it in a very like minimalistic contemporary look. Um, we use it to kind of make things edgy. I'm seeing it come up all kinds of places um, and then in the flooring. So a lot of uh, positive aspects if you're going for that certain look. However, it can be a little bit fatiguing if you have to stand on it and it can be cold. Another thing to consider with using brick is that it's really hard to hang pictures up or, you know, put electrical in the wall. So, but it generally is um, somewhat um, recyclable and green. So let's take a look at some brick ideas. Here, bricks can cut, brick can actually cut, or I keep calling it brick. I'm so sorry, cement, <laughs> cement. Let's go back to cement. Cement can be also done in um, tile-like formats where they put it up, giving it a more businessy uniform vibe. And I can and cement can also be um, stained. It can be used in a raw format like this tilt-up wall for a really industrial minimal vibe. And it can even be acid washed to kind of create an older look. So cement is really, really um uh and I keep saying cement, but concrete, <laughs> I don't know what's wrong. Concrete is really um one of those multi-use uh, uh, treatments. So as you see here, they all have kind of a little bit different vibes. So um, concrete, it's really big right now, going for that industrial. In fact, you're finding a lot of concrete mixed with the brick to create that really um, uh, industrial thing going on. I just got to get my words right. So um, concrete is an option for walls. Now, next, we're going to talk about something maybe you didn't think about is glass. Of course, um, glass has been around. Oh, it's a wonderful sub uh, uh, substance. It can be used like in this building here. We see a curtain wall. That's what we call a whole glass wall. But it's very much reinforced with these um, steel beams to add strength, right? But glass comes in a variety of colors and textures and forms and different transparencies, um, it's highly resistant to corrosion. It's non-polluting. It requires minimal maintenance other than washing it, you know, cleaning the glass. Um, now, when we use it, we use it on non-load bearing walls because we don't usually have the structural uh, support. And um, you see a lot commercial uh, and offices especially, but in residential, you might see glass block or pavers. So uh, mirror. That's a form of glass. So here's a couple options here. Um, this kind of cool uh, a glass, uh, contemporary looking um, closure for a closet where part of it is spangled or it has a film on it. And the other part is just kind of slightly has a tent to it and a little bit of a, a, a texture. Here you might see uh, glass actually walls separating different offices. So they have visual um, access, but that it allows for some privacy. And in this kind of cool little loft, it reminds me of a little greenhouse. This little gra glass partitions here, um, they kind of open up the space. And yet, you know, you might need some little curtains for privacy. But that kind of creates an interesting look that maybe you hadn't thought about. So glass is one of those things that also can be sandblasted, glass block walls. These are all um, part of that type of wall treatment. Now we're going to talk about something that's been around a really long time as well, and that's plaster. Um, it's really an old material, very traditionally used on walls and ceilings, and it's very historical. Um, 
they used to use a, use it in wood wood lath and strips. It's called lath and plaster, and that was a way of construction. It's it can be very ornamental. The thing is, it's a substance you can actually pour it into molds. So really, um, it can be used. Yes, almost like a, a treatment, and it also can be used as a decorative element in in its whole uh, mold like As you see here, this was placed in a mold, poured into a mold. It dries. And it, you can create any design. So it's fabulous. It also can be straight. It can be curved, as you see here. And um, you can give it visual texture. So it's really in the unlimited use of your imagination. We see it a lot in coffer ceilings and details, moldings, medallions. Uh, and so it's a real fun thing to use. It's very hard. It, it, it can ship, though. But the funny thing is, is, it's simpler to repair because it is a it is kind of like almost a soft material that turns hard. You can build it back up. It is also non toxic. That's a good thing. So that makes it healthier, and it is has a lot of intrinsic fire resistance to it. So it helps protect a building as well. Uh, very popular in commercial and residential. Here, look at this. There's so many things you can do, right? You can do a traditional, very highly textured, kind of giving that Santa Fe vibe. Um, you could do more of a Venetian plaster, which is quite expensive treatment to do. You can add a um, little gold leafing to it. Or, like I said, you can use the molded plaster to create endless amounts of details to any wall. Something that looks like Louis the 16th from, you know, a palace, a French palace to a whole panel that has a very contemporary leafy impression. Um, modular arts, you should check them out. They do the greatest um, plaster type of finishes for walls and they come in large platforms. You can just place them right on that wall and you're adding some fire resistance. They're non-pollutant and they add great texture. Next, we're going to go to stone. Stone has been around forever as well, right? And we use a stone on interior finishes all of the time. Um, and there are several types of stones that um, we use, whether it's marbles and granites and stack stones and sedimentary metaphoric rock. There's all different kinds of stones that we use that are available to us. But many of the times, we use a stone veneer as a designer um, when we're putting things on walls because it's so heavy. Not all the time. Maybe a fireplace, you might use real stack stone that's thick, but a lot of the times we're limited with thickness and stone is very heavy. So if you're putting full marble on a wall, um, you have to make sure that that wall can hold that amount of, of, of weight. So in some cases, I have a little piece of stone here. Uh, these are strips of stone. Let's say if this was on a fireplace, it's a beautiful, see, it's just some great, like this special kind of various travertines has different textures. There's a little mi mix of marble as well. And so if this was on a fireplace, it's very thin. So we can just apply, apply it right on top, but you really can't tell when you see, you don't know how thick it is when you see it. So this is a beautiful option to add some stone veneers. I love that there's sandstone here. There's a rough, there's a rough texture. They even have some smooth travertine mixed in. So you can mix stones and it makes it very um, warm and inviting. Um, so that's kind of a... The, the rule of thumb is using a stone veneer and it's used for both commercial and residential. When you see this huge uh, stone um, wall here, fireplace, it's just giving you that old world vibe, a lot of texture and warmth. Um, that's very chunky, but you know, stones used on flooring, furniture, toilet partitions, countertops, right? Um, so it does add that natural texture, but it also can be, depending if it's rough stone or smooth stone, one will give you um, a more um, homey, rustic, um, kind of uh, uh, less formal um, impression, and the other might give you more formal and a, a more very expensive luxe look. So the stone can vary in um, texture and its appearance giving a different look. So 
when you're picking stone, you got to figure out what what's the look you're going for. Here with this kind of cool little Santa Fe and all this stack stone that adds delicious texture, giving that warmth to that space and a great focal point wall. Here you're using a beautiful travertine and it's just very neutral. A travertine is a beautiful stone and um, giving it um, a little just a nice neutral warmth without being too textural and rustic. Here, once again, a more rustic vibe with all these um, stack stone slates. And it's a little bit more fine-tuned than this because this is tumbled and rough. Um, here, though, you have this amazing Carrera marble, very luxe, very elegant, very high-end. So depends what kind of look and vibe you're going for, but stone is always a great option for walls. Next, it's my go-to tile. I do a lot of commercial design, especially in restaurants. We use a lot of tile and there are so many kind of tiles and you have so many options. Now from wall tiles, you can have ceramic tile, quarry, porcelain, glass tile. Um, creates that nice hard barrier. So when you add that tile onto a surface, you're really creating a nice hard barrier and it allows for moisture not to penetrate. This is why you see tile in your bathrooms on the kitchen backsplash, right? And um, it is definitely something that can add in a tremendous amount of design impact. It could come in these sheets that are already on a piece of mesh, or you can individually, in some, they're just individual tiles. So it just kind of depends. And you just have numerous amounts of options. So look at these tiles, they're all different. Here they have this beautiful glass tile. It's um, on the backsplash here, really adding a lot of color and elegance, kind of a beachy vibe. Um, over here, just this little subway black subway tile in the shower, once again, creating that barrier. So you'll find wherever you have wet, um, wet surfaces, kitchens and bathrooms, not only do you need that um, semi-gloss paint, you also need a tile barrier. This is part of codes as well. Uh, here, this fireplace, very contemporary, beautiful relief, almost sculptural tile. And then over here is fun geometric patterns and how they whimsically place the color just um, kind of floating in there. Another thing you can do with tile, because tile creates pattern, you can change the grout color to a contrasting grout. And pretty soon it really makes that tile stick out. So in this case with the black tile, you've got white grout and it really shows that tile pattern. A tile is a spectacular way to, to really add a lot of interest into any wall space. Now, once again, you know, you have to pre get the electrical in there and that sort of thing. Um, it is could be kind of costly. And you also have to specify the grout color. Now we're going to talk about wall covering because it is making a huge comeback. And some of the funnest wall coverings are these big, exaggerated scale, um, like mural type wall coverings. So they're available in many colors and, and patterns. Um, and some of them are washable and stain resistant. Some are pre-pasted on the back. So you they're easy for install. Now, in my world, um, uh, it, they're vinyl or the type of wall coverings that we use are basically three different kinds. But what I use, number one, is vinyl wall covering. Vinyl is really for commercial space. Now, paper wall covering is more suitable for residential. And then there's a textile wall covering. And that's mainly also as residential. Um, wall covering can last 10 to 15 years. It is so durable. I put it in hospitality, down hallway corridors of hotels, medical facilities, very high, high traffic um, areas because it really adds a lot of protection. So you know, your typical vinyl wall covering for commercial is not too exciting, but the good news is it comes in every color, size, and texture. So very durable, very affordable. It doesn't fade. It's scratch proof. Like I said, it's antibacterial. So this is why we use it in places like restaurants and hotels. Um, it doesn't get too dirty. Uh, medical facilities, right? It um, does, however, because it's vinyl and vinyl is um, can be kind of toxic. 
it does give off VOCs, off gases. So when you do put the vinyl up on the wall, it's important to air out the building for at least a few days, okay? But how does this come? This comes in 54 inch wide goods and we sell by the yard. That's how a um, vinyl wall covering is um, sold. And it is called type two. So in my code book, if I'm doing a commercial space and I have to look up the type of construction and what kind of space it is, it will say, yes, you are required to use a type two wall covering. This um, lends itself to the flame spread. I know that it is safe for a commercial space, type two, where a um, type one is the second kind, the residential, which would be more of a paperback um, uh a paperback space. And that comes in like rolls, individual rolls, 36 inch wide rolls, and they sell single and double rolls. So it's really important that um, you understand the difference that a type one paperback uh, wall covering would not be suitable for many commercial spaces. Um, it's definitely more um, uh, prone to, you know, not as flame resistant, but a wallpaper base dates back to you know, 200 BC in China, where they used to put silk on the walls or a, 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 a grass cloth. So that's another option: textured, colored, uh, textured wallpapers, uh, meaning textile. They could be silk, they could be fabric, cotton, grass cloth. Um, those I would not recommend in a commercial space either. I stick with vinyl. Anyway, when you are um, um, ordering wall covering. And when you are installing it, it's important, the bigger the print, the more you have to match the edges. So the larger the print, the more extra wall covering you have to purchase so that you can line up these prints. It's really important, you know, that you have enough wall covering. And um, many wall coverings and textures, they come in different colorways. That's what we call this. This is like in different colorways. So this particular like let's say wall covering might come in 15 different colorways. So it might come in the blue. I could probably find this texture in the red. So that's what it means with colorways. That's the color. So one type may come in many, many, many colors. Uh, fibers for wall covering, like I said, the textures or the textile wall coverings, those might be cotton, linen, silk, grass cloth. Um, they're not used as much these days, but they do. They are very luxe, extremely expensive, and they're not cleanable. So you have to be careful. Um, but they do add texture and beauty and um, probably not good for high wear and tear, like I said. Now, when you order your wall covering, it's important that if I order wall covering, when I order it, I make sure it's from the exact same dye lot, dye lot. That means that when they ran this wall covering, um, I want to get that run so that the colors match perfectly. It's called dye lot. And it's important that you know the dye lot number. So when you go to order it, and let's say you have to order extra, you make sure it's from that batch. Okay. It's like, you know, you can make 20 batches of cookies and they can all taste a little different, right? Just depending on just a little extra vanilla or so it's really important to get that color match. Here's some wall covering that are really fun. Um, you can have wall coverings that look like terrazzo stone. Um, you can have wall coverings that have metallics added into them. Even ones that look like this wonderful splash of, of, of water paint. And this is what I'm loving these days. This big, just almost mural-like. It just really makes a focal point and very exciting. It really just sets the tone for the design um, the intent in this space. So wall covering has come a long way, super fun, and I really enjoy using it. I did a medical facility in Washington, and we did an entire entry. It looked like a huge piece of quartz, and it was stunning. It was just huge and life-size, very beautiful. Next, we're going to talk about good old wood. I'm telling you, brick concrete and wood. Those are the three that we're really seeing in that whole industrial vibe. And it's still very prevalent. It's still going, still tre on trend. But um, wood has been around forever. It's a great insulator. It's eco-friendly, um, very multi multifunctional. Um, when you have wood that has a lot of details to it, and it's custom, we call that millwork, like wainscot, um, a paneling, the all of the various components of fluted columns, that's called millwork. 
um, and you would find that in a more um, expensive, conservative, formal type setting. And it just incorporates so many different styles. Now, once again, it's good to support your local wood um, um, forest and making sure that it does have that, you know, that stamp, that FSC uh, stamp on it. So wood, like I said, it's just got so many applications. You can do something that's very rustic, like this uh, reclaimed wood. And that is what this is, actually. Now, here we have a little wainscot, which is when you have up to a chair rail that adds added protection here. And that's just a simple little V groove um, hung uh, vertically. It's more of a traditional type of a um, aesthetic. Over here, we have our shiplap. Um, that could be either a full panel with grooves or it could be separate planks to create this horizontal line. Um, once again, we talked about millwork, and this is what I would consider a custom millwork wood paneling. You have these relief panels, you have these fluted columns, it's stained impeccably. You might see something like this in a formal bank or a lawyer's office, and then lovely wood textures that we can use. So wood, it's a wonderful, wonderful options. Now we can check off walls. <laughs> We've hit all the major points. Um, there are still many treatments you can do, but we need to now dive into flooring. Okay. So you'll see that many of the things that you can use on walls, you use on flooring. However, flooring has a little bit more rules attached and codes and not all wall finishes can be put on floor. So let's see. Okay. So flooring, floor covering, um, factors to consider when you are specifying those. Um, you want to make sure that you know the function of the room, right? Is it a kitchen or is it a playroom? You know, is it a bathroom or is it a um, laundry room? You know, is there water going to be, um, you know, is it a moist area where there's going to be water on the floor or is there going to, is it going to be high traffic? So it's really important to know what's happening in the room. You want to know the aesthetic requirements. Do they want it to be really luxe or warm? I mean, and inviting, very practical. Um, the cleaning, the maintenance of it, uh, what that includes. Is there allergies? You know, if someone's very highly allergic, you probably might want to stay away from carpet. Um, the acoustical properties, does it need to absorb sound? Um, a lot of restaurants uh, worry about that or offices, so they have carpet to help absorb sound the installation time, also the budget should really be in there, and any potential hazards. Hey, this shiny marble floor might be a little slippery, and I certainly wouldn't put it in an area that was had wet um, the potential for water or liquid, like in a restaurant. <laughs> so you got to see if it's going to be potentially hazardous. Now, we deal with three types of flooring. We have soft flooring, resilient flooring, and hard flooring. I'm just going to go, go with the main soft flooring, which is carpet. Now, of course, other soft floorings might be um, uh, uh, rugs, area rugs and tapestries, but it all kind of falls in this line. So we're going to talk about um, the number one soft flooring is carpet. So carpet, um, been around forever, it used to just be woven, um, woven tapestries and carpets. That's our first, main, mainly cameling from rugs. But from there, we have taken the rug idea and then created the full coverings. So um, it used to be that carpets or what we call tapestries or these rugs were for the very wealthy. And um, they would put them on hard surfaces, right? We love our area rugs. They add a lot of design element. Um, but carpet um, is a wonderful surrounding to, to cover a lot of surfaces. It comes in so many colors and patterns and, and you know, really enhances an interior. And it does have some um, insulation qualities. It really feels good on the foot. You know, when you're walking on it, it's, you know, uh, soft to the touch. So now... The performance of carpet is evaluated by the flammability rating, the maintenance, the ease. Is it stain resistant? Does it absorb sound? Is it the sound absorption? Some carpets will absorb more sound than others. Um, static electricity control, that's important in offices or wherever you have a lot of computer equipment. The appearance, right? We want to look at the appearance. Uh, the resistant to sunlight. Some carpets fade in sunlight. 
uh, resistance to wear and tear and abrasion. How durable is it? Okay. Now, carpet comes in a few ways. We're going to talk about the two major ways. One is broad loom. That is when it is manufactured on a huge, huge, huge um, wove. Uh, uh, it's woven on this huge broad loom and it, um, it weaves it and it's like up to 12 feet, 13 feet to 15 feet wide. Very large. A typical room might be 11 by 11. So when you have 12 foot wide carpet, you don't have to have any cuts or seams. So this is why they make it so large. So it's good to know what the sizes come in. Not all come in all three sizes, but if you have a room, let's say that is 14 by 14 feet, you certainly would not want to order 13.6 wide. You would want to order the 15 foot six wide because no one wants a six inch strip, right? So broad loom is um, one way that the carpet comes. And another way is called modular tiles or carpet tiles. And those are just individual square tiles that we set and they come in 12 by 12 or 18 by 18, 24 by 24. That's mainly used for commercial. And they just inset in and in like, like almost like putting tile and you just glue it right down on the floor. They're great for commercial. Um, and if you destroy one little carpet square or you spill red wine on it, you can pull it out and reinstall. So that's the benefit of this modular tiles used mainly in commercial res um, restaurant, hotel, um, not so much hotels, restaurants and offices. Okay. And, um, the problem with a lot of carpet is does harbor a lot of fungus, mold, and mildew. So if you're in a really, really wet area, um, a beachy town and stuff, you have to be careful that you would maybe pick a carpet that doesn't absorb a lot of moisture or is more moisture resistant. So where it just sits on top. Now, tufting inserts. So tufting is how we make this um carpet and that's when you weave in the yarn in a backing okay and we create all these loops that's called tufting and that's how our um carpet is made right um these days now dyes um there's different ways that the carpet is dyed there's it's either the color is inside the fiber itself so that makes it so it doesn't fade or the carpet is manufactured on a broad loom that is gray we call that gray goods, and they dip it in a vat of dye. And that way you have various colors. Maybe it's violet and hot pink. I mean, so you can, you know, and that's mainly for residential um, uh, carpets. So different ways that the carpet is dyed. It's solution dyed, it's inside the actual fiber itself, or it's actually dipped. And once again, just like the wall covering, you want to make sure when you're ordering your carpets from the right dye lot number again. So if you order carpet from 2265 and you need some more, you want to make sure that you order from dye lot 2265 so it matches. Unless it's going in a totally different room. So let's take a look. Okay, there's different kinds of fibers. We have nylon carpet. That's very non-absorbent. So that might be good for a moisture area because it's not going to absorb a lot of moisture. And abrasion resistant. So it's good for high traffic. Uh, wool. Um, we use a lot of that in casinos. That's naturally flame resistant. So that's a good thing. Um, it's excellent for dyeing. So wool, we dye. We use, um, uh, that would be the gray goods where you dye the yarns. Acrylic is easy to maintain. It's static resistant. So it's like, hmm, I'm doing an office. I should probably make sure that it has some acrylic components. Polyester is fabulous for its fade resistant. So if it's a really sunny area, um, it is resist water soluble stains. It does not resist the oil stains. So you have to be careful with that. And it's very luxurious. That's why we use a lot of polyester in our clothing. And it has a uh, a nice feel. Now we're going to talk about the type of piles. That's the has to do with the actual thread, the actual tufting of the carpet. So the most common type of carpet piles is just a cut pile. All that is, is like I said, when they tuft the carpet, they just loop it in and out, just a bunch of loops, and they just chop off the top of this loop and you get a cut pile. Okay, just cut the little loop. That's a cut pile. It's your standard residential um, a carpet. Now, a Berber 
is a bunch of loops, but they're kind of thicker yarns, maybe two different colors. So you kind of get this very texture, almost looks like wooly, fat little threads. It gives little nubs, gives a lot of texture. It was very popular in the 90s. Now, shag carpet, you know, that was big in the 70s. And it is really a cup pile, but the yarn is at least an inch and a half. Okay. So that inch and a half, once it gets an inch and a half, like as long as your hair gets, you know, if you've got short hair, it's just going to stick up. But the longer it gets with that weight, it tends to get just a lot of unruliness. See how it just kind of lays everywhere. It's got a great feeling when you are walking in it. However, most people don't put shag on their whole floor. They just create little area rugs with it. Because I am telling you that harbors uh, any coins. Uh, you lose your earring, forget it. Uh, you might find popcorn and, oh boy, does that just trap in everything that falls into it. It's really hard to vacuum and clean a shag carpet. A lot of times I've had area rugs. I have to dump it upside down and shake it. And boy, am I shocked what's in there. A level loop is the most common for commercial. So cut piles most common for residential. Level loop is just a little simple loop and it's very tightly woven and it's a little tighter. So it's hard to cut the top. So it's a, still a loop, but it's, it's so tight that just really closely in there. You would find this in commercial. And that's why, because it's so tight in there that, that anything that spills on it can just sit on top. Okay, where here they have the crevices and it can get to the backing. And that's why residential, you know, if you have pet urine or something spills in there, it can get trapped in the backing. So it never fully gets clean. So that level loop is important. Now, a Saxony is just a cup pile, but the yarns are a little longer and very smushed together, leaving a very luxe. So it's a higher end cup pile. And you see that it's just really tight. It's that, you know, when you do the vacuum and just see the rows and that is really a higher end carpet because it's so tightly woven. And so the, it's kind of like the thread count on a sheet. I don't know. You, know, you have the high thread count. That's similar. It's like a high thread count uh, for Saxony, making it more velvety. And so because they're all pushed together, that is also better for um, if liquid spills, it kind of sits on the top of that as well. A frezzy is very similar to a shag. It's not as long, but they twist the the little um, they twist the little threads, the the little um, these little yarns. They twist them, and sometimes they even add a shiny yarn in there, so it gives it a lot of movement. Um, this is would be more formal, where this would be more of a casual um, type of uh, interior. And then you have the combo cut loop, and this is endless amount of designs where you have some cut pile and a couple of loops in there, and you can create any design that you can imagine. You, um, carpet is important. You can do custom carpets as well, where you um, you come with a manufacturer or certain manufacturers, Asmester, and they do um, custom carpets. I did a lot of custom carpets um, when I was working for a casino design firm. So when you go down one of the hallways in a casino and you see it's very custom with decorative elements, exactly the, the width of the hallway, those are all custom. You work with a CAD operator, they help do a takeoff of the design, and then they will actually make you a little memo sample. They're cute. You get to pick each little yarn. It's quite, quite, quite enjoyable and fun. Very creative. Okay, we're going to the next um, type of flooring. So the first one was soft. We're talking about carpets, the different kinds. And the next one is resilient. Okay, so that's a little step in between. And we'll look at resilient flooring. Now, one, our first kind of resilient flooring, and let me tell you, resilient flooring has a little give, okay? So it's resilient. It's got a little cush to it. So each one of these floorings have a certain amount of give, the little forgiving, you know, if you drop something on there, it doesn't necessarily break right away. Um, that's why I love resilient flooring. It has, it's a little easier to walk on. Now, it's not soft flooring, but it is that, that great in-between got some great uh, um, great attributes. One of the oldest resilient floorings is linoleum. And linoleum was invented in the 1800s. Um, it's made from linseed oil, resin, wood flour. And so it's very green. And um, 
They place it on a jute backing. They mix and grind this stuff up. Um, and it's really highly resistant to a lot of foot traffic. So you can just, you can't wear it out. Um, and it's naturally antibacterial. So not only is it green, it's antibacterial. So it's great for hospitals and um, food services, food service cafeterias. Um, it requires less energy to manufacture. And it is definitely returning back to popularity. Let me show you. You might, hey, you've probably seen this. What's lovely is it comes in kind of rolled sheets and you can cut into it like laser cut and create different designs. Here, they actually laser cut a logo right there. Um, it also comes in 12 by 12 squares. So you can place a checkerboard in this little, little uh, cafe. Um, we did a Taco Bell where I utilized it and did the Taco Bell logo on the floor. I've also wrapped columns around it, super durable. And so because it's pliable, it even comes in like wood texture. So this is a great green option for commercial, especially. Uh, so our next resilient is now what we see all the time is vinyl. Now, there's different kinds of vinyl flooring. The vinyl composite tile flooring is something that I use. It's very inexpensive. I wonder if I, it's made out of a little limestone. It's all mixed in. And it is great for like storage rooms, places that aren't fancy. And it's definitely great, um, a very durable, resilient flooring. And it comes in um, all different colors and little textures. And um, you find that in... Um, on its own, it could be brittle, but once you put it in there, it just lasts forever. This this came on the scene in 1930, and it's really great for heat resistance as well. And it's super durable for heavy equipment on it. So I put it in equipment rooms and maintenance rooms, but you might see it in uh, medical facilities, and it's uh, a part of a vinyl. There it is, right? And it's kind of brittle. You can kind of break off, but once you put it in, it lasts forever. I'm telling you this stuff. Mainly it comes just in 12 by 12 squares. So that's how you place it. So if you want any decorative elements, you're just can only checkerboard it or whatever. But you would see this in locker rooms and um, other facilities. Very inexpensive and a, a great economical way to floor. Now, my favorites that I use a lot is the sheet vinyl, the sheet planks or tiles. So the sheet vinyl comes in very pliable. Okay. Now, these are the most um, uh, popular Brazilian florists. Right now, the biggest, biggest trend is the wood plane for vinyls. We call this vinyl, um, uh, luxury vinyl planks, okay? And it could be in a tongue and groove where it's kind of installed like, actually, I have the wrong side. Installed like wood, okay? Super easy to install. See, just clips in. Great flooring looks like wood. It's even got texture. Okay. So I love this. I use this in restaurants. I, I have this in my own home. And so we love our luxury vinyl tile. This also just comes where it's just a sheet where you could just glue it down. Okay. So you either can do a floating floor, which is recommended if you want a little more cushion or put it on the second floor or in a commercial space right on the concrete. So that's a vinyl. Now, this rolled vinyl is great for medical facilities, things that you don't want to seam, um, and it is super durable. And it can be any kind of gloss. It has multiple different applications. What I love about this for my medical facilities, it self coves, so it can go up the wall. And um, there's different kinds of sheet vinyl. There is, a, they call this one, so homogeneous and heterogeneous. Homo is that means that this vinyl is all the way solid through. That's what I want for high traffic, especially any hospital or institutions. The heterogeneous is a sheet, but it's just a layer of paper with the plastic on it on a backing. So it's not as durable, but this is great um, use for, you know, uh, like I said, I use a medical institution. And the beautiful thing about my vinyl resilient flooring is it's waterproof. It's waterproof. So you could put that lovely wood looking thing in your bathrooms, your kitchens. I put them in restaurants and it's easy to clean, very forgiving, and they have commercial grade and very inexpensive. 
It also contains recyclable material, so it's green as well and super easy to clean. So look at this. I mean, they even have it in prints and rolls or in tiles that look like full on ceramic tile. They have it in the wood planks I just showed you, the rolled vinyl. You can do separate planks that look like real wood. So this is really an uh, um, exciting uh, option for a value flooring that has great performance. Next, we're going to talk about something maybe you haven't thought of, and that is cork, another oldie but goodie. So we have linoleum, uh, cork, 1904, they've been using cork. It's uh, made out of the bark of a, a cork oak tree, and it is very green material. It's very resilient, durable, a lot of good wear resistance. It adds acoustical installation because cork is a little porous. I put it also on walls as well, cork wall covering. It's a resistant to mold and uh, mildew. This is why we use a cork, uh, a cork in wine, right? You don't see the mold. Uh, it also, um, furniture or high heels can cause it to dent, but the good news is it's self-healing where it just expands back. Um, it can fade with sunlight if it's um, dyed really dark. So the, it does hold dye really well. And it's very natural. So I'll take a look at some of the options. Also, it is gaining a lot of popularity because of its green qualities. It comes in tiles, planks, strips, a bunch of colors. You might see it in um, transportation areas. And it's naturally non-toxic. So this is a great option. Biodegradable, recyclable, renewable, kind of like a, a, a good, a good one-stop shopping. So cork, real fun. Um, you can see it in different colors. They can do it in, in tile patterns. It's geometric. And like I said, it's really giving when you're walking on it. Um, it has a little give. So that's why these resilient florins like linoleum and the vinyl and the cork, they're kind of soft, right? They have, they're kind of in between, okay? And if I dropped something on this cork, it probably wouldn't break, might bounce a little. It's easy to stand on for a long time. Now we had some beautiful options with resilient flooring, but we are going to dive into our final um, type of floorings is hard flooring. So this is now going where these are a little less forgiving, I should say. You drop something on hard flooring, probably 90% of the time it's going to break. Okay. So, but they have great benefits, especially for commercial and lots of wear and tear areas. Hard flooring. Designers and clients choose hard flooring for their, um, a lot of times for their, their, their look, right? They're durable and they're easy to clean. Um, hard floorings are desirable for people with allergies because all of the dirt and any allergens just lay on top and you can just mop them up, uh, unlike carpet where it absorbs in it. And um, it Though, however, <laughs> it does not have a lot of acoustical properties, so it will not absorb any sound. You have some sound absorption with resilient flooring, and you have a lot of sound absorption with carpeting, but with hardwood, not so much. Um, these floorings are, can be also very slippery when they're wet, so they may have some danger factors as well and can cause a lot of fatigue if you stand on them for a long time, especially concrete. Some are better than others. So the first one we're gonna talk about is wood. Uh, there are two types of wood, hardwood and softwood. Now we use hardwood for flooring. <laughs> um, it's durable, beautiful color, texture, has a warm feeling when you walk on it. Um, it's a renewable source, right? And um, you have to make sure, though, the climate is correct for wood, because if your climate's too moist, wood expands and contracts. So extreme weather conditions is important um, consideration when using real wood. Types of flooring, I mean, it comes in strips and planks and uh, parquet tiles, so lots of different options, different qualities of wood. Um, wood strips, planks, they're cut in that tongue and groove, like um, I just showed you with that vinyl flooring. So tongue and groove is where you have a groove and a tongue and they snap into each other, right? So like that. Now, the wood flooring would be thicker. This is smaller because it's vinyl, but it's the same idea, tongue and groove. Super easy to install. 
Now, 90% of our wood flooring nowadays is engineered hardwood, and that is when they make it on the factory, and it is layers of wood. It's very compressed together, so it's super durable. It's already pre-finished, so no, none of those VOCs or um, off gases are given. It's all done in the factory, and it is super compressed, and it is very durable. Um, wood floors, they look great, but they scratch, and they can fade in the sunlight. I have scratched my real wood floors and I prefer my vinyl flooring over my wood flooring because of that very factor. Um, and they were fading in the sun. So you have to be careful. Uh, so people should use walk-off mats or some kind of doormats so that they don't collect dust and, and little, you know, things that could scratch your wood floor. So probably asking people to maybe take off their shoes if you have a real wood floor might be an option to help preserve them. I'm glad I don't have to do that. My floor is pretty indestructible. That Forest Stewardship Council that 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 we just saw that little that little sign, that little eco green sign, that's really important to set standards for uh, responsible forest management. So when you're picking a wood flooring or engineer flooring, you know, look for those that that little stamp. Beautiful. I mean, the sheen that wood floorings have. Oh, the grains. They do have a lot of depth and richness. They come in strips, parquet. Even now you can do geometrics and they're pretty easy to install. But you have to make sure, you might need to make sure that you have a moisture barrier underneath because they are very subjected, um, uh, subjective and don't respond well to moisture. So you never want to put wood in any area like bathrooms and kitchens that you know, might have moisture sitting on it. It can cause some serious issues. But next, we're going to talk about laminate floorings, which is a great option when you're on a budget, but you want to look, you know, want it to look more like um, a wood flooring because it does have that nice sheen too. And um, there are different kinds. Of, now, laminate, just like it sounds, is when you laminate something, you have a substrate and you just put layers of paper on it with a with a sealant. And that's what laminate is. So it's a very thin layer of type of a paper that looks like wood. So it's like a color Xerox. Okay. And has that um, board backing, that MDF and board backing. Um, it's really tough, uh, easy to clean, but it, it lacks a lot of dimension. Sometimes it's not as a textural. Um, and it comes though in many sizes it's great for residential. I put it in my kids' bonus room when I in my other house. It's awesome. But it does doesn't feel quite the same. It's kind of hollow when you stand walk on it. So it's good to put a little um sound barrier underneath to give it a little bit of a, a cush. And you could put it in small commercial spaces, maybe a dermatology's office or something that's not too, doesn't get too much foot traffic. But once again, tongue and groove, easy to install. See that little foam underneath there? That's a little foam barrier. They put that in there to give it a little cush. Um, it can look like wood. You could place it in different ways, a chevron or parquet or a, a herringbone. Um, so great look, great option. Next is similar as bamboo flooring. And it's kind of done um, little veneer strips. They take bamboo. Bamboo is very much like little wood, um, very green bamboo. Um, and once again, they just place it on the same like planks, tongue and groove, easy to install. Uh, and they may dry to put it in layers and push it together. So there's different kinds of bamboo, but it is a great substitute for hardwood. I just wouldn't put it once again in too wet of areas, but here they have it in hairdresser. I've seen it in yoga studios, but it's really great for its green, uh, green elements. So you could see that this one is the face of the bamboo. It has that little nodule. They also do it in strips to create some cool tiger stripes. You could see it in little pieces like that, where they put little um, slices and glue them together, making the whole plank. So there's a lot of options with bamboo. Now we're going to go from our wood species and options of wood-like floorings, hard floorings, to stone. And marble is one of the um, um, ancient stones that's been around forever. Um, back in Greek and Roman, you can still see some um, pieces of their marble flooring from way back then. So 
Um, it's a bit, it's a very elegant and durable material. It's been around forever. Um, it's used for almost any surface marble. It can scratch. You have to be careful about that. It's not as hard as granite. Um, but the thing with marble is very heavy. So you want to make sure that um, you have a subfloor that can handle the weight. It's a beautiful natural product and it lasts for a very long time, hundreds to thousands of years. And in this case, you see, you can also inset various pieces and make it a mosaic. So it's extremely luxurious. I wouldn't say marble would give you a rustic look. If you're looking for a high-end and a luxe look, marble is for you. Here you can see this extraordinary insets in some, you know, a French palace of Versailles or somewhere. Or it could be luxe, like a Carrera marble. Um, it can be uh, shiny. It could be it could be what we call polished or unpolished. Um, so you could see it can be set in tiles or larger formats. So marble, but it can be slippery. So be careful of that element. It may not meet some codes that it might not have enough slip, slip resistance. So marble has to be also sealed. So be careful with that too, how it's um, you know polished and so forth. And the maintenance. I would be more concerned about it getting wet. <laughs> but wow, what a different, very contemporary luxe look. Now, secondly, just the, almost the opposite effect is slate, where that has a very earthy look. And slate is different, coming with many, many layers. So when you have slate tile, it could chip. And so um, it comes from different parts of the world, India, China, uh, different colorways. It's very naturally beautiful and it adds a lot of warmth to a space. And so it's slip resistant because it's more irregular on top. It's like the opposite of marble, uh, very non-exorbent. I have slate right now in my outdoor patio, but I've had it in my last two kitchens and my last two homes. And it's great because it doesn't show a lot of dirt. <laughs> um, so you see slate a lot in BJ's Pizza. They love their slate floors, but it does have to be, have a sealant, but you don't have to keep resealing it. Um, and it comes in many shapes and sizes. So here you see slate where it's got more of the earthy tones. It's act, this is something more like BJ's. It can come in, in uh, irregular color, sizes. You can fit it. You can put it in a herringbone Oops, pattern. Sorry. And uh, something a little bit more contemporary and sleek, just in a like a 12 by um, a 24 format and more of the gray tones. So slate is definitely more warm. Um, it definitely has more of an earthy vibe and it's very durable and um, somewhat green. Travertine is something in between marble and slate. This is more of a neutral type of stone. It's kind of got um, a similar in, in strength, sediment, another sedimentary rock. And it comes in huge blocks. So when they slice it, a lot of it comes from Israel. You can create tiles, pavers. Um, it could be, it's although it's a little soft and porous, so you have to really seal it. Um, so it's kind of prone to a, a scratching and staining. So it's got to seal it well. But it's very eco-friendly and recyclable. And it has this kind of beautiful neutral look. So it could, it, it adds warmth, but luxury at the same time. I had travertine in my bathroom in my um, last home, and it was beautiful in the bathroom. I mixed it with polished marble, and I mixed it non-polished and polished to create some interest. So you see here, you could actually have tumbled edges where it gives it that more old world look, or you could put it together, creating more of a mono um, floor where it's just all seamless. It goes from golds and more, more um, yellows to cream and more of a light taupe. So that's the color variation, doesn't vary much. And it, you can see it's just a beautiful, nice, um, neutral type of flooring. Then you've got granite. Now, granite is one of the hardest florins that we have. And what's wonderful is that it really is heat resistant. That's why we use it for countertops and kitchens. Um, so it is resistant to uh, scratching. It is super hard because the way that it was crystallized under that hot magnum, it really makes it um, uh, heat resistant. Luxurious, comes in multiple colors. 
and it has a sheen to it. It could be polished, horn, or flame. And it's very permanent and very stable. It's not green as far as renewable. It takes hundreds, if not thousands of years to create granite. So, but it is luxurious and it is very durable. So looks a lot like marble, but it's harder. It's actually harder material. You could have a polished, it could have insets and, um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful product, a product, very expensive. <laughs> so it's not really, if it doesn't fit in your budget, you know, we all wanted those granite countertops. Now we've replaced them with quartz, which is different with this uh, mixture, uh, man-made stone. Okay, so we've got that. Next, we're going to wrap it up with um, tile. So once again, just like, just like wall, um, wall, you've got ceramic tile. Um, that is the most cost-effective tile. It's the most common in the USA, but it's actually being taken over by another type of tile. It comes in every size. And once again, ceramic is a clay base with a glaze on top. Now, you don't want a high gloss ceramic for flooring because that would scratch, but it is easy to maintain and repair. It's very cost effective. You could put it in kitchens, um, restrooms, because it's, you know, waterproof and it's very, very common. So ceramic tile is beautiful. It is, um, can come and look at this prints. It can look like travertine. It could look like marble. It's got lots and lots of options. But the problem with ceramic tile, it's not quite as strong as porcelain tile, which we'll talk about in a minute. So this was our first go-to until they developed porcelain tile, which is even, even stronger. So ceramic tile is almost like your laminate versus versus wood tile or engineered wood. Um, it has the glaze on top so that if it breaks, you see the clay body and that's not always optimum. So it can crack or break. It's not quite as strong as others, but it is beautiful and very cost-effective. Now, um, ceramic tiles, tip, tip. now um, the next type of tile we're gonna talk about is a form of ceramic tiles, quarry tile. Now, quarry tile just is, that clay body without the glaze on top. And I use this solely for commercial kitchens because it's not that pretty <laughs> and very durable, very inexpensive, but it's basically like your McDonald's kitchen top. It's slip resistant. So that's fabulous for my commercial kitchens or industrial settings. So yeah, not so pretty. Here, it's a commercial kitchen. You might see a McDonald's. This is elephant gray. <laughs> Once in a while comes in a fancy shape, but not so. Here, you might see it in a, I don't know, a, a bus stop, okay? But, or a commercial cafeteria. You could hose it down. It's fabulous that way. But quarry tile, not my favorite. The next one is my favorite, porcelain tile. <laughs> it is very low water absorption rate. So it is great um, uh, for um, any area that you want, you have a lot of water and it's bacteria um, resistant and stain resistant. Very, very hard. It's odor um, resistant too. So restrooms is perfect. It won't absorb any urine or um, great in restaurants. So I use porcelain and it is a wonderful space here. You see it in a restroom, very cost effective, and they're making them very a better a pricing. So they're matching ceramics. So ceramics kind of like on its way out and porcelain is basically the go-to for commercial spaces. And it's environmentally friendly and it's very hard. It actually takes an actual diamond saw to cut through a porcelain tile. So when a porcelain tile is that, that strong and it's full body clay, it's very durable, bacteria um, proof and waterproof. So it's a lovely option. So once again, looks a lot like ceramic tile, but what's so beautiful is that the whole clay body is the same color and you can literally make it shiny. It can look just like Carrera marble. It has a vibe that looks like wood. It comes in all different shapes and sizes. So I love porcelain. Now to wrap up concrete, we kind of touched base with that with, um, with uh, the walls. 
And once again, those same attributes for the walls is great. It's, um, uh, it is very durable, but it is prone to have some hairline cracks. We got to be careful with that and it must be sealed. So it's an expensive option. Okay. And it's very versatile. So you can polish your concrete floors and stain them, um, do acid wash flooring, or leave it pretty much like just with a sealant, giving that kind of, you know, that industrial vibe. And then that brick, which we started off with, with our walls, similar, right? Very strong, um, no VOCs, it's, in, it's, it's fade resistant, very anti-slip. So it's another option and it definitely gives that more like homey country kitchen vibe. Um, and it does have a large kind of grout joint. So you have to make sure you seal that part. But it definitely has an, a, a warmth to it and a very more historical reference, right? Old world. I think we about exhausted our hard flooring. So florins, three types, soft floor, resilient, and your hard floors. So we just kind of wrap that up. That's all, folks. You guys did great. Um, let me stop my share. I'm going to stop that share. Yeah, here we go. So we really covered a lot of material. Thank you for sticking with me. We've got finishes, the, our responsibility to make finishes safe, um, economical, making sure that the right finish for the right um, purpose. And we now know all of our wonderful different um, types of flooring. So thank you for joining me. And um, I will um, talk about part two at the second part of the chapter. So enjoy and really think about all the wonderful things that we have to to consider when putting finishes on walls and floors.